So a couple of days ago, I picked up my new MacBook Pro, and today I wanna walk you through how I set it up to power my productivity workflow. I've used a MacBook almost every day for the past seven years for work, university, and my personal projects. And in that time, I've collected 17 apps that genuinely help me stay productive. To keep things simple, I've split everything into six categories, starting with the apps that upgrade the Mac experience. So the first app is probably the one that's actually had the biggest impact on my productivity. And it's an app called Alfred, which I guess is just a replacement for the default Spotlight search, but it adds a huge amount of additional functionalities that Spotlight doesn't have. So on top of a lot of the basic stuff, we can activate it in much the same way, and I can start searching for anything you would on Spotlight. Although the one thing you can now do is you can start to search in specific areas. So I can press spacebar, and it brings up this open file command. And now I can go documents and it'll open up my documents. And we can also do things like search in the web. So I can type in YouTube and it'll automatically recognize that I want to search YouTube. And then I can search for whatever channel or video I want and it brings it right up. So that saves a huge amount of time compared to going onto the browser, going to youtube.com, then searching for wherever you want. And obviously there's ways of doing it with Google. So I can type Google and it'll search Google for things. And you can create all of these custom workflows from within the Alfred app to suit whatever need you have. Now moving on to the next app, which is one that I really wish I didn't have to install, if I'm being honest, and that is a snapping feature for the windows. If you've had a Mac before, you may notice that you can't sort of pick up a window and drag it to one side and it will sort of stick to that side. Um, and there's no shortcuts to be able to do that from a keyboard either. This app, Rectangle, allows you to do that. So I can pick up my browser window, for example, and I can drag it to the left, and you can see this pop-up that will come up, and it'll stick to the left, and then I can have multiple apps and arrange my window, my desktop, as I want. There's also keyboard shortcuts with Control, Option, and then the, um, the keypad. So I can use the arrow keys for left, right, up, down. I can also press Spacebar for full screen. I can use plus and minus to increase, decrease the uh, size of the window. And there's a bunch of other shortcuts which we can find um, up in this menu bar at the top. So all of these shortcuts, you could also create your own. But for me, it's a free, easy app to install. It adds a huge amount of functionality for a very lightweight app. And where this really comes in useful is you've typically got a smaller screen, maybe that's 14, 16 inches, and you don't have a, a full monitor. Then being able to organize your desktop and your windows is, is much more important in that case. And so an app like Rectangle really helps. The next app is again one that adds Windows functionalities to Macs, and it's an app called Alt-Tab. Essentially what it does is it gives the Alt-Tab functionality that you have in Windows to switch between tabs, and it adds it to Mac. Now, Macs do have a similar functionality, but it's a lot less powerful. It's a lot less efficient than the Windows version. So what it does is if you press the shortcut to open the Alt-Tab features, for me, that's Command and Tab, then it'll bring up a preview of all the windows you have open. And what it actually does that I really like is not only does it show the preview, but it actually shows you the individual windows for a given app rather than just the app itself. So I've got two different browsers open at the same time, and it shows me two different previews of those. And what really is the most powerful thing about this is it's super customizable, so you can choose Choose not to have the previews, you can choose to just have app icons or take the app icons away. You can customize it all from within the Alt tab uh, menu. All right, so moving on to the next app, and it's the one that I recommend that everybody install on their MacBooks, especially if you're a user who keeps your MacBook plugged in most or all of the time. And it's an app called Al Dente. Now, if you're a keen viewer, you may have noticed in some of the B-roll footage that I've shown that my MacBook has been plugged in most of the time, but it's not charged above 80%, and that's because I've installed Al Dente. It's a way of controlling your battery charge to prevent overcharging and putting an unnecessary amount of strain on the battery. Battery. And the reason this is important is because MacBooks have lithium ion batteries which power them and they degrade over time. One of the features that Al Dente has is it first of all allows you to set a charge limit. So you, I've got it set for 80%, which is a recommended amount. And what that does is it means that my MacBook won't charge its battery more than 80%. Now I've personally got the paid version for this, which is not that expensive at all, and it's a lifetime license. And what we can do is we can go into a dashboard and we can see a huge amount of information about the health of our battery and the status that it's currently in. Now it might seem like an app like Al Dente isn't super important for a new MacBook, but ensuring that you're not putting unwanted strain on your battery and you're not damaging your battery is super essential right out of the box. The last app in the Mac upgrades category is a VPN. Now I like to work a lot in cafes and coffee shops and being able to securely connect to a public Wi-Fi 
is really important to me. And so I use Surfshark VPN. From my own research, I found them to be one of the best for speed, for number of VPN locations that you can connect to, and for allowing unlimited devices on one account. When I was traveling New Zealand recently for about three weeks, I connected to Surfshark and I'd connect back to a UK a server and that would allow me to watch Netflix on the UK or watch BBC iPlayer, all of these different things. And so on top of the sort of privacy and security features that a VPN offers, it also allows you to access geo-restricted or geo-blocked content online, which is super useful, especially if you're traveling. So if you travel or you work in public places a lot, then just get a VPN. They're usually pretty cheap. You can find loads of discount codes online and it gives you a bit of peace of mind when you're browsing the internet. So moving on to the next category of apps, which is all about productivity. And the first one I wanna talk about is Notion Calendar. Now we'll get onto Notion in a little bit, but Notion Calendar is essentially just a minimalist calendar app that allows you to, to sync your calendars from maybe iCloud or Google Calendar, and it integrates seamlessly with the Notion app itself. Now I use Notion Calendar to plan my day-to-day -day activities, to time block certain projects, and to plan my YouTube schedule. And actually I really wish I knew about Notion Calendar while I was still at university because it's it's a great way to sync your university schedule with your personal schedule all in one place in a sort of distraction-free calendar environment. And it becomes especially useful if you use Notion as your main productivity hub or if you plan a lot of projects in Notion. And so speaking of Notion, it's the next app I want to mention. Now I've been using Notion for a number of years, largely for project planning, but also for some university work planning as well. Now I'm not going to spend too much time talking about Notion in this video, but for those of you who aren't aware of what Notion is, it's essentially an all-in-one workspace for notes, tasks, and databases, which is great for building things like second brains or for developing life dashboards or for planning big projects. Now it's very flexible, but it can be a little overwhelming and that's where templates and tutorials come in really handy but the one thing it's got going for it is the fact that it syncs across all of your devices now the main way that I use notion as I've said is to manage and plan my YouTube videos so I can have a look at my YouTube dashboard on notion and this is all completely custom made so I make all of the templates for this myself we can look in videos for example and now we can see a, a huge database of video ideas and videos that I've already worked on that are all in one nice neat place. Now some of these will be blurred because I want to publish them eventually and so I don't want to spoil anything but we can see some of the ones that I've already done, the ones on habits or physics versus engineering for example that did pretty well. And one of the really useful things about Notion databases is that we can organize by a bunch of different parameters that we assign to each item in the database. So for my YouTube videos for example we can see I've got the title for the YouTube video, we've got the status of the video so whether it's an idea, whether I'm filming it or whether it's been uploaded. I can assign tags to specific videos to allow me to filter through those and I can also add things like the sponsor of the video which in this case is Brilliant. Brilliant is an online learning platform with thousands of courses in maths, science, data analysis, programming and AI. If you've ever been in a lesson or watched a YouTube video on a STEM topic and found certain concepts difficult to understand or just found that the information wasn't sticking, Brilliant helps to fix that. It lets you get to grips with concept through hands-on problem solving which is a method proven to be six times more effective than traditional video-based learning. And on top of this, all of the content on Brilliant is created by a team of researchers, professionals, and teachers from Stanford, MIT, Caltech, Google, Microsoft, and much more. I've recently been going through Brilliant's logical reasoning course on their app, and I found that this not only helps with the more mathsy parts of my life, but even with things as simple as structuring arguments more clearly or with better decision making. So if you're a student or a professional who wants to level up their STEM knowledge and understanding, then Brilliant is the perfect tool for you. To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, plus get 20% off your annual premium subscription, head to brilliant.org slash lewiscooper, scan the QR code on screen, or click the link in the description. And the final app in the productivity category is Cold Turkey Blocker, and it's just essentially a website and app blocker. Now the reason I use Cold Turkey Blocker over other blocking apps is that it's very strict in how it applies to the blocks. So there's no real way of turning it off once it's been turned on and it even survives restarts. Now I use Cold Turkey Blocker to create deep work time. So if I know that I'm scheduling in four hours of work on a given day, I'll set a block for that time that pretty much blocks all distracting websites. But we can create a bunch of different blocks depending on what websites you need to use, which ones you definitely don't want to use. And you can create schedules as well so it automates the blocking process so that it doesn't require any willpower other than the initial uh, process that you set up. 
So now let's look at browsers. Now you've already seen the first browser that I've used. It's a browser called Brave. Now there are four main reasons why I switched from a browser like Chrome to a browser like Brave. The first is that it's built on Chromium, which means that I can install all of the extensions that I would have on Chrome on my Brave browser. The second is that it's much lighter than Chrome. So it runs a lot faster and it uses a lot less RAM. This not only helps to speed up the browser, but it can also reduce the power consumption, which is really useful for a laptop. Now the third reason is really obvious if I go to a brand new tab, and that's this information that we get at the top. Brave actually blocks a lot of trackers and ads across the internet. So, so far in the limited number of days that I've been using this browser on this laptop, it's blocked 15,000 trackers and ads. Uh, it's saved me 151 megabytes of bandwidth from blocking those trackers and those ads. And that adds up to a bunch of time that it's actually saved me in waiting for things to load. So it's really a lot quicker than most traditional browsers, especially a browser like Chrome, and it can also add a bunch of privacy and security features. Which leads to the fourth reason why I switched to Brave, and that's that it actually adds a bunch of features that Chrome doesn't have. So you can experiment with things like vertical tabs if that's something that interests you, or you can have a dedicated reading list which is separate from your bookmarks, and on top of that it has a really nice and intuitive reader mode which is really great for reading articles. Now in addition to Brave, I've been experimenting with some other browsers lately, and one that I've really liked is a browser called the Zen Browser. What the Zen Browser is, is essentially an alternative to a lot of the features rich browsers that we have nowadays. It's kind of just like a minimalist distraction free browser that's super useful especially if you have a lot of tab clutter. I mean what it really does is it enforces this sort of deep work I guess digital library environment where you sort of forced to focus and you're not bombarded with a lot of digital noise and visual features. I guess it's really perfect if you plan to do a lot of reading or writing or research on the internet. Uh, it sort of enforces that sort of library feel. Now much like with Notion I'm planning on doing a full video on Zen and how I use it for researching but essentially it's a, just a distraction free minimalist browser which I recommend especially if you're a student or a knowledge worker. The next category of apps are my note-taking apps. Now I actually use three different apps for taking notes and they all serve different purposes. The first is the default Apple Notes. Now I've been using Apple Notes for like 10 plus years ever since I had my first iPhone and I genuinely think it's a really underrated app for taking notes because I can be out and about and I don't have my laptop and I don't have a notebook. And I can pull out my iPhone, jot down some thoughts or notes and later on when I get back to my laptop I can access all of those notes because they sync through the iCloud. The second note-taking app I use is for handwritten notes. It's actually an iPad app. It's called GoodNotes, but it allows me to sync my handwritten notes from my iPad onto my MacBook, which I can then use and access later. Now, I mostly use this throughout my time at university where I would write my lecture notes, my calculations, my exams, if they were online exams, all on my iPad, and then I'd be able to revise them later on my MacBook because it has features like uh, searchable handwriting, which is an absolute game changer. And the final note taking app I use is called Obsidian, and this is where I have my personal knowledge management. I guess you could call it my second brain. It's where I track my notes and highlights from thoughts or from books or from other notes. Essentially anything that I'm thinking that is particularly important, I just import into Obsidian and I can link up my knowledge through different forms. Obsidian is a really powerful app for deep and linked thinking where you can track your notes and your highlights from things like books, from your thoughts, from your own notes and create links between all of them so that it kind of works as a second brain. And my favorite feature about Obsidian is that all of your notes are stored as plain text markdown files on your local machine, which means that you're not locked into Obsidian's way of proprietary formatting. And if something happened to Obsidian, for example, you still have all of your notes on your laptop that you can access anytime from another app. It's just that Obsidian offers a really good way of visualizing your notes and visualizing the connections between them. So I use Notion for things like big structured projects, but I use Obsidian for deep thinking, for journaling, for idea development, the things that I don't wanna share until they've been polished. And the final category is the Creative Projects apps. Now we'll start with the apps that I use to make these YouTube videos. So for editing my videos, I use Adobe Premiere Pro, and that's just for general video editing, for cutting and splicing and organizing all of my footage. And then for the graphics that you see throughout my videos, for the animations, I use Adobe After Effects. 
Now, as much as I hate the predatory tactics that Adobe uses to get people to subscribe and stay subscribed to their products, just the amount of features that the Adobe Suite has and the way that the apps integrate with one another makes it a no-brainer for me. So I use Premiere Pro to edit my videos, but it's so seamless for me to import all of my animations from After Effects that I'm working on at the same time. And on top of this, there's loads of plugins that make the editing and animating process so much easier. I've not even come close to understanding all of them or to streamlining my process, but even the plugins and the shortcuts that I do use makes the process so much quicker. And then when it comes to creating the thumbnails for my videos, I'll use Adobe Photoshop, which is a super famous app for photo editing. And Photoshop has become so much more powerful recently, especially with their generative AI features, which I've been using to clean up some of my uh, thumbnails. And now my coding platform of choice is Visual Studio Code, which is a free code editor that has a number of plugins and extensions that you can use to write code in so many different languages. Now I've used Visual Studio Code for web development, for Python, for Jupyter Notebooks, for JavaScript, and it just runs so seamlessly on all of those. It comes with quite a few really powerful inbuilt tools like a Git integration or an inbuilt terminal or a debugger mode, which really help to streamline the process of creating code and keeps all of those features in one place. And much like Chrome, it's got this own uh, like extension marketplace, which allows you to customize the layout and the style and the functionality of the code editor itself. So that's how I set up my MacBook for maximum productivity. If you found this video helpful, feel free to check out the links in the description. I've included everything mentioned there. And if you've got any favorite Mac apps that I haven't mentioned, leave them down in the comment section because I'm always on the lookout for new tools. But with that being said, YouTube thinks you'll like this video. I think you'll like this one. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.